You're listening to the Drawing the Ideal Self podcast for April 2023. Today's episode is going to be about post-traumatic stress. The first thing I thought might be helpful would be to look at the symptoms of post-traumatic stress because there will be some people who listen to this podcast who are less familiar with them. Bear in mind this is from a psychiatric point of view and it's taken from the NICE guidance, which is the guidance that's used in our health services. So what they list as the symptoms are re-experiencing the traumatic experience, avoidance of situations that are connected with it or generally, uh, hyperarousal that can include hypervigilance, anger and irritability, negative alterations in mood and thinking, emotional numbing, dissociation, and that means not feeling connected with where you are or who you're with, feeling a bit outside the situation, emotional dysregulation, interpersonal difficulties or problems in relationships, and negative self-perception, including feeling diminished, defeated or worthless. Now they also list the things that are potential causes as serious accidents, uh, assaults, both physical and sexual, uh, abuse, which could be abuse in childhood or domestic abuse that's current, work-related exposure to trauma, uh, which can include remote exposure. So you don't have to actually be in this situation, but you know of the situation and you know that could have been you in that situation. Trauma related to serious health problems or childbirth experiences. And the examples they give there are intensive care admission or a neonatal death, war and conflict, torture. Now, these aren't the only events that can be traumatic, but they are a common list. So there's a PCP model of an approach to post-traumatic stress by Kenneth Sewell. In Sewell's paper... He talks about Kelly being focused on anticipation and how important that is. And anticipation of the future is the key to helping people with PTSD. He also said, although Kelly focused on the personal side of construing, there is recognition within personal construct psychology that humans construe in social contexts. Indeed, Kelly's concept of sociality as the role relationship potential created by persons attempting to anticipate the constructions of others is central to understanding phenomena as diverse as schizophrenia, love and psychotherapy. With the present framework, both of these emphases are incorporated into the understanding of trauma by stipulating that traumatisation, although individual in expression, is inherently social insofar as the trauma itself has social components. Furthermore, a traumatised person's attempts to improve symptomatically occur in a social context. So what he's saying is it's not just about the construal of events. It's the fact that we live in groups and pairs and we relate to people at work, at home, at school. And the construing of people and our relationships with them may also be affected. Sewell devised his model in conjunction with Cromwell, and it's published in 1990, and he says, that model proposes that a person who encounters an extreme experience that cannot be construed in relation to their other life experiences often creates a trauma-related construct subsystem. Thus, a person with PTSD is predicted to be operating at least sometimes from within an outlook on life that might have been validated by his traumatic experience, but is not being validated by the rest of his life. Such fragmentation, along with other more esoteric aspects of the model, is said to account for the various symptoms and presentations of PTSD. He goes on to say, Individuals who persist with PTSD, and I I don't think he's being critical of those people at all, he's just saying that it can be difficult to shift it. So individuals who persist with PTSD seem to view their lives in extreme, negative and relatively unelaborated ways. 
That is, they tend to become stuck in their construal of experiences around one or two core constructs, such as good versus bad, or in control versus out of control. Although there are some difficult to assess individual differences in who develops symptoms following a trauma, these differences may have little importance in understanding recovery. It is possible to identify risk factors for PTSD. However, even individuals at low risk can develop PTSD if traumatised at a high level. Perhaps more importantly, once a person develops PTSD, the original risk factors fail to predict the recovery pattern. In other words, once a person has PTSD, it does little good for the treating clinician to focus on what might have made that person vulnerable to trauma in the first place. The more appropriate therapeutic focal point is how the person is construing and trying to make sense of the traumatising experience. The readaptation process after developing a post-traumatic stress reaction appears dependent upon elaborating the traumatic experience such that it enters into more varied and hierarchically abstract relations with other life experiences. Elaboration of a trauma is likely to require both the development of new dimensions of meaning as well as some reorganisation of how their current constructs relate to each other. He says a central focus of this chapter is the important distinction of event versus social elaboration. When a person is traumatised, there is a disruption in at least two different and important areas of construing, event construction and person slash social construction. When a person's construing of events is disrupted, the individual's sense of order in the world is disturbed. The result can be catastrophic anticipations and anxiety. When a person's social construing is disturbed, the result is an inability, sometimes leading to an unwillingness, to anticipate and thus effectively participate in social relationships. This impaired ability or unwillingness to relate to other people leads to a sense of socialisation that is independent of the anxiety created by event construal. In considering what is disrupted in any one person, event construction or social construction, it is crucial to understand that it is almost always both. Within this framework, traumas are therefore seen as disrupting a person's construction of experience in both event and social domains. However, the disruption in one of these domains is likely to predominate at any given time in the experience of a person. These changes in predomination of event versus social disruption imply differences in the optimal role of the therapist as the person recovers. When the disruption of event construing predominates, the therapist can collaborate with the client in combating symptoms and designing novel behavioural experiments outside of therapy. On the other hand, when social construction disruption is predominating, Therapy should be viewed as a controlled microcosm of the client's world in which he or she can be socially related. The therapist's optimal role becomes that of collaborative social problem solver. In this role, the therapist must invalidate the negative social predictions but persist in valuing the client and offering the self available as a target rather than retreating from attacks as most others in the client's environment might. In reference to the client's life story, this role is that of a valued audience member, someone with whom the client cares to share her story. So Sewell is emphasising the personal and also the role relationships that people will have. And obviously you could have a look at Kelly's uh, diagnostic terms and see what they have to say about those kind of experiences. They're very helpful, I think, especially guilt is a useful one for PTSD. He proposes a helpful metaphor, which is that plan A is the main plan of construing, and plan B is the type of construing that has to happen because plan A has been found not to work. So plan A, he says, is how I anticipate the world will work 
and how I will be humanly connected with it. Plan A is the basis of my ongoing anticipation. In personal construct terms, plan A is made up of my emergent construct poles. So when you're talking to somebody, the constructs that they will tell you about are their emergent poles. They're the ones that they're aware of. So if I said I felt sad, you know, I'd be aware of being sad. I might not be so aware of what is called the contrast pole or the implicit pole because it's implied by sad. And that might, for one person might be happy, for another person might be calm, for another person might be just not sad. So then there's plan B. And plan B is how the world must work and how I would fit into it if plan A fails. Plan B consists of the implicit poles of plan A constructions. Implicit poles of constructs are the tools with which invalidation is anticipated. So the traumatic experience causes plan B to become plan A. And once plan B becomes plan A, psychological energies must be devoted to making the world make sense, be predictable, from this new frame. So before the trauma, plan B didn't necessarily exist. And he says, now where is plan B? A new one must be developed due to the energy and attention required to make the original plan B function as plan A. The development of a new plan B can be difficult at best and neglected at worst. That often leads to the paranoid stance that the new plan A must hold. There is simply no choice. There is no perceived plan B. That is an expression of a highly simplified, unelaborated plan B in which the implicit poles of all constructs are essentially a unitary anticipation. That I will be out of control or I will cease to exist. That stance leaves the individuals with both symptoms as well as vulnerability to continued invalidation. So this idea of plan A and plan B means that the therapist's role becomes clear. And he says, a therapist must assist traumatised clients in elaborating alternative constructions such that the invalidation experienced daily can be met with positive change rather than relapse. To achieve that end, a model of post-traumatic stress psychotherapy has been developed. So let's think of those through some examples. So, a child who is a teenager and rides to school on their bike gets knocked off by a car there aren't any injuries but they are from that day unable to ride their bike to school and in fact gradually their attendance at school deteriorates and they spend a lot more time at home because they cannot any longer go to school so plan a which was the way they anticipated the world before this traumatic event included constructs like I can ride safely alone to school, I can manage traffic, I can get to school on time, I can get to school and feel okay when I arrive there. And if this child uh, in particular had difficulties with relationships and that's why they weren't walking to school, then not being able to go to school on the bike means that they don't go anymore. So their contrast poles might be things like I can't ride a bike anymore. I, I can't ride on that road that goes to school. I can't go to school because I can't ride at that time in the morning. And I might get bullied if I walk, so I can't go to school anymore. So this traumatic experience has affected not only the construing of self and the personal abilities like being able to ride a bike, being able to judge traffic safety, being able to uh, get to places on time safely and be reliable, but also construing of people. So uh, an increased vulnerability because the person might not have realised how this accident happened and how they came to be knocked off. So does that make all people dangerous? Uh, does that mean you can't construe anymore and you don't know how to judge how dangerous somebody is or a driver is? Also, a sense of the trauma affecting relationships wider than just 
within the house. So perhaps anxiety symptoms in the house, so crying, being unable to get out of bed in the morning, being terrified of going to school. But when that fear has passed, because the time has gone by and you're still at home, being OK again. Uh, so the the avoidance of school means that the emotional regulation changes and that you feel calmer again. And as soon as somebody mentions it, the anxiety starts to increase. Most of us don't want to do things that make us feel awful. So it's not an unusual response. It's just a response. The other thing it will affect is how you relate to people at school, about school. Uh, friendships so it may have interfered with friendships it may have made those feelings of worry about being bullied actually increased because it's now not only threats from other people who you can see and they're standing in front of you and they're your age it's threats from other people who are separated from you in a car you don't even know them but they're not taking care of you and it may actually validate the construing of you know, I am worthless and not worth anybody taking care of me and people can do me harm. Another example is a person who is present at a meal and somebody chokes on food. So because they have had their first aid training, they know how to do their Heimlich manoeuvre in theory but when they come to do it, it's very difficult to do and at first it's very unsuccessful Eventually the person survives, but the trauma of that affects both their construing of themselves as a person, as a learner, able to take on the information in their training, and also of their ability to go out for meals and things like that, so that they avoid places where other people are eating, and they find that when they're eating certain foods, they become very, very stressed. So therefore, they lose a lot of weight because they can no longer swallow comfortably. All traumatic experiences will lead to a change in how people feel, which is usually the reason for a referral. So they can lead to having nightmares, waking up in the middle of the night, feeling very stressed or fearful. Um, you know, in an extreme case, maybe ready for fighting because that's their only solution to that situation. They might have moments in the day where normal things happen, but they trigger responses in them that are related to the trauma. So if you think of something ordinary like uh, a bereavement, you, know, you may remember what you were doing at the time that the person died. And that's become connected in your head uh, and it may not cause you any problem. But if it does, then every time you do something like if you're washing up at the time you've got the call, every time you're washing up, you're more likely to remember it because we have a situational connection with memories. So going back to Sewell, what is his model of psychotherapy? So he suggests that one important thing is the idea of meta construction, which is the construal of a construction process. He says meta construction comprises the sense of self when an individual construes his or her own construction processes at present in relation to his or her own construction processes at various points in the past. That allows the person to build a sense of a future self. In other words, we construct slash construe our future construction processes on the basis of past and present processes. And he goes on to say, thus, a post-traumatic stress reaction represents a breach in the continuity of metaconstruction, a breach that implies disintegration of the self. He has a nice way of describing this in a metaphor. So there's a metaphor of a barber's chair. And he says, imagine sitting in a barber's chair with a mirror in front and behind. The images of front and back, front and back, front and back, repeat until they disappear into infinity. Think of the back image as representing the past and the front image as representing the future. The chair itself and your experience of it is the present. A trauma results when the figure in the chair is different from the image in the back mirror. When this is the case, predicting what will happen on the front mirror from image to image seems mind boggling at worst and not conducive to self definition at best. In this way, any dramatic change can potentially be traumatic. 
Thus, a trauma often initiates a construction of the present that seems too incongruous with the past to be seen as emerging from it. Consequently, the lack of continuity between meta-construed present and past impairs the ability to make coherent future meta-construction. Growth involves elaboration of the present and past meta-constructions of both events and relationships such that they are construed as continuously linked. Then the future can be meta-constructed in a non-fragmented, non-constricted fashion. So what he's saying here is that key to recovery is the ability to find connections between those past experiences and the present experience and the future experience. And this is one of the things I particularly like about PCP, that that does not include whatever anybody else would think of as something which can disrupt your sense of self. So for another person, they could go through the same experience and be unaffected by it in the long run. They might have some initial anxiety and then recover really well. Our past will influence the way we construe. And that fragmentation of the trauma causes problems for the sense of self in the future. So working with the world as if the trauma is the only way of being makes things very difficult for the person to move on. So Sewell talks about what needs to happen in the therapy sessions. So he says it must be borne in mind that the items discussed here as elements of reconstruction are not to be understood as stages or phases. The elements are discussed in the order they are likely to emerge in any one therapeutic relationship. For example, it is difficult to engage in effective trauma reliving without first doing a substantial life review. However, it is not the case that a client graduates from one element to the next, never to return to it. Cyclical repetitions of utilising these elements should be anticipated and validated. So we don't expect people to work on these as if they are uh, in an order that stays the same way and that will never be changed. So my experience of working with people who are being traumatised is that actually the story emerges as a first story and gradually changes over time. And the implications of it at first may not be fully seen, but over time, implications are picked up and noticed. So we wouldn't expect people to just stay with what they say at the beginning. And we also wouldn't expect them to work through these in some kind of manualized way. So symptom management. And he says this element can be thought of as the negotiation of present meta construction, such as examining what it is like in the barber's chair. The overriding goal of this reconstruction element is to gain the trust of the client by helping to alleviate some of the presenting distress. In addition to installing the therapist as an important social figure in the client's life, the relief of debilitating anxiety and or social dysfunction also enables the therapist to recruit the client's energies towards elaborating his experience, as opposed to simply surviving. Any relevant method can be employed in this reconstruction element to find a way to relieve some of the client's pain. So sometimes for PTSD, people will need some medication. He's not saying don't do that. Sometimes they will need some advice about how to sleep better. So sleep hygiene, but also uh, maybe a management plan for if they wake up frequently with nightmares, help to work out what would they could do to reduce the impact of that. So we're looking at symptom management as something that we can establish quite early on in a process, but also it builds that relationship with the therapist because that relationship needs to be strong and good in order to look at the traumatic experience. The second thing he talks about is a life review. So he says, the evocation of past metaconstruction, exploring the rear view mirror, is accomplished via life review. This involves the client sharing her past metaconstruction with the therapist so that the therapist and client share the story of the life upon which the traumatic experience apparently intruded. The next thing he talks about is trauma reliving. And he says specific trauma related metaconstruction is evoked to bring the therapist into the trauma 
examining how we got in this chair and allow the experience to be reconstructed together. This element involves psychologically taking the therapist to and through the trauma. The prefix re is never constrained to simple repetition. Instead, it is open to reformation slash transformation. Thus, reliving does not mean living it then the exact same way. Rather, reliving requires the client to live it now with my new resources, my new co-narrator, my new audience, towards a new resultant self. It is in this focus of therapy that the therapist begins to leverage the valued co-narrator and audience data nurtured via symptom management and life review. So in order to understand the trauma that people have gone through, it's essential to know what it is and to be able to be with them whilst they tell their story and to be able to hear the horrors of it. Obviously, this points to the need for good supervision for that therapist as well. The next part of the model he talks about is constructive bridging. Once the therapist and client are facing the abyss of the client's traumatic experience in a collaborative joint manner, the therapist can begin juxtapositioning the client's various meta-constructive levels, sketching on the rear view mirror and on the chair, that were really sketches all along. The therapist helps the client to lay remembrances alongside introspection, introspection alongside reflection, reflection alongside the sociality with the therapist, and weave stories between these metaconstructive levels that cohere and communicate a viable sense of self. Bringing the temporal and social dimensions of understanding the self in relation to the trauma serves to build a new construct, that is, a new experience of the trauma. So here the therapist is trying to do what the client's struggling with, which is to make sense of themselves in relation to their experience. You know, the way they've been, the kind of person they were before that traumatic experience, and to move forward into the future with a new idea about themselves. And this idea about themselves, their construing of self, will be more connected than their fragmented view, which was created by the trauma. The next part of the model is intentional future metaconstruction. This reconstruction element involves the co-construction of a future for the client, sketching out several mirrors in front and trying them on. Often, traumatised clients have no clear sense of the future. With others, the future is seen as presenting only more trauma. Extending the co-creative process of constructive bridging and intentional future metaconstruction involves composing possible future selves. So there isn't the idea that it's going to be one person, that this person becomes, that there are many ways of being. So it's about trying to find ways to help the client develop the kind of person they want to be that includes having had this experience. It doesn't mean that they wanted the experience, but the experience is a fact. It happened to them. And it's their construing of themselves as a, a person who has had the experience, but has still got a future that's important here. He says, as intentional future metaconstruction is explored in therapy, new ground for constructive bridging becomes available. These iterative processes continue until the trauma is storied within the client's grand narrative as an important but integrated component of the overall story, one that has influenced but has not single-handedly determined the client's life. And in conclusion, he says, in presenting this model here, I am less concerned with technical instruction and more with attempting to orient the therapist towards helping the whole client. Technical interventions of the sort promulgated by manualised programmes tend to target the client's disorders or symptoms as though they exist apart from the person and her or his identity. The theoretical framework presented here and the broad technical conceptions outlined as reconstruction elements are intended to centralise the client 
and his or her overall, social as well as symptom-based, functioning as the target of psychotherapy. If you're looking for something that might be useful within this whole process, you could have a look at the Belgrade Difficult Experience comic strip. Now that was developed really from working with a few children and young people who had experienced traumatic events in their lives. And it can be used for either a difficult experience which isn't traumatic or a majorly traumatic experience. And the idea of that is that first of all, before you do that, you will have done drawing the ideal self. So you've got some understanding of the person and where they want to go. So the key to helping somebody with trauma is, first of all, the recognition that trauma is entirely a personal experience. What one person experiences as trauma is not necessarily what the next does. And then the idea of the trauma leading to a fragmentation of their construing system. So they develop a, a way of construing that is separate from the way they used to see themselves. And they live using that whilst they're still traumatised. The role of the therapist is to help the person connect themselves back into one construing of self so that they can get on with their lives and so that the events that they've experienced become something that they're able to take into that new construing of self rather than trying to protect that by um, working only with the fragmentation. And there's no idea here that people do this with any uh, deliberateness in, in the sense of they're not trying to be difficult, they're not uh, necessarily aware of what's going on. Obviously, this is a personal construct psychology lens that we're looking at traumatic experiences through. It seems to work to me. It'd be interesting to see how you find it. OK, so that's all for today and I will see you again at the end of May. Bye.